Now, here's an in interesting thing. You don't need a computer to practice equalization. Um, but you can do it with something like a, a, a simple little um, virtual reality, or virtual reality, virtual sound check program. So I've got a semantic audio card. So they have a U-Track X32 card that plugs right into um, X32 M32 class console and allows you to do uh, multi-track recording to a USB drive. Um, that also allows you to play this stuff back. So I'm going to just play with this for uh, just a minute. Give me a second to get this up on screen. There we go. So now you can see over here, I've got I I'm, I'm basically have a band that we recorded before. I've got a kick drum over here on the left, and I'm mostly worried about this bass guitar over here. And the beauty of this, I mean, I've got everything on here, but what I'm going to focus right now is this idea of the kick drum and the bass guitar. So let me get out of this. Let's go ahead and engage this on the kick. One second. Yes. Am I on screen? There we go. So now this is a little M32 with an iPad app. I can go in and change the sound of the kick by changing right here. As you can see, I'm spanning this thing up. I'm going to give this a little bump right here around oh, 5 kilohertz to give it a little slap. But what I may choose to do on the bass guitar is get rid of some of that. See that, so that's up on channel 24. I think I'm gonna have to bump around and restart. Come on, there we go. So, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna call up my bass guitar now so that you can kind of see what we're doing. Let me engage the, this. So what I may do is roll off some of these highs out of here. Are we on screen? Yeah. And I may go ahead and boost some of this bottom here on my bass guitar. And we're going to do the opposite on the kick drum. So let's go down and visit our kick drum. And our kick drum sitting down on 17. So let's go ahead and add a little bit of bottom in on that. There we go. We can add in some of the other instruments too while we're at it. So then it's just really a matter at that time of just going ahead and figuring out what levels we want of each of these instruments. So we can add vocals in, drums. Whoops. Everybody kind of get the idea? The two main things we're worried about are our bass guitar and our kick drum. So what we're trying to do is get these two guys to kind of work together so we can hear everything. Okay? Okay, so let's bail out of that. Um, now we're going to talk a little bit about EQing with microphones. That's really uh, a lot of um, what we do. Um, um, it used to be when I was a young kid that if I had a couple of SM58s, you know, and, and a few SM57s, I thought it was life was great. 
Um, it was only later that I started experimenting with microphones that I, I found that there's this hundreds and hundreds of con uh, different kinds of microphones, and they kind of make instruments sound completely different depending on the type of microphone, where you place them, all that, all, all that other kind of stuff, and also the technology inside of the microphones, whether they're condenser or dynamic microphones. And I've, I've, I, I've, never, I've never looked back. So I just keep collecting mics and experimenting with them. So let's talk a little bit about this. Um, each type of microphone has its own equalization with, which affects the um, sonic signature of the instruments. But just as importantly, the position will change the sound drastically. I'm going to ask Carl to come on up here for a minute. And Carl and I have been playing music together for, golly, nearly 40 years. Cool. Long time. Um, so I'm, so hey, Carl. Carl, you're on, man. Here's your big moment. Woohoo! Let's have a hand for Carl. Look at him. He goes, "What? What? He's back there, just." If this is my big moment. That's your, your big. Uh, that's your trouble. He said, "Yeah, big trouble." So what we're going to do right now? You don't need to plug in just yet. I'm going to have you just go on the microphone. So we don't need you on this side. And I'm going to I'm going to set this up so that you can kind of watch what he's doing. So Carl, let's see. Give me just a second. There we go. Hi, Carl. There you are online. So let me get you up in the in the PA system, and I'll okay, go ahead and uh, play just a little tiny bit for me. Okay, can you bring me up in the house, guys? Okay. So I'm not going to do a lot of EQ on him right now. I'll bring my voice down a little bit, Harry, please. My voice down just a smidge. There we go. So what I'm going to ask Carl to do is move in and out of the microphone and move left to right as he does, as he plays. Now, he's got a pickup inside of this guitar, but I want you to see if he starts on the bass side of the guitar and starts moving. Move left to right, Carl, if you would. See how different it sounds? What does that tell us about miking guitar players? It's difficult, it's challenging because when you have it sounding exactly right, guess what they do? They move. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh man. So they've put really, really great pickups in these. So um, Carl, I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and plug in your pickup. I'm gonna go ahead and kill this and plug in your pickup. And he's got um, a Fishman DI here. It's one of these combo units. It has a microphone inside as well as a, uh, a pickup under the saddle. So go ahead and see. Go ahead and hit it a little bit, Carl. Play a little bit of anything you want. Now you can move around, you can dance if you want, right? Okay, that's very good. Thank you, Carl. You can, the, um, the check's in the mail. We'll just, we'll just go hang out for a little bit. <laughs> okay, so you can see part of this. Now, how much did you pay for that pickup? That was, that was like a $370 pickup. Okay, so Carl likes Sweetwater. Everybody likes it. Every, Carl loves it. Every, they, Carl, I think Sweetwater loves Carl a whole lot. They really do. Um, so, so basically, you've got, what, a $1,200 guitar, I think? So a little more than that, he says. Yeah, my guitar's a little more than that. $1,500? $1,500 guitar and a $400 pickup. Now, it's what, $1,900, $2,000? And some people might think that that's crazy, but guess what? That is your instrument. So a couple of thousand dollars for your instrument really isn't that bad, um, especially, you know, if for something like an acoustic guitar, um, it really comes down to, you know, priorities um, of, of what you guys think is important. Um, but um, so if you have like a worship leader or whatever that's got an acoustic guitar, a couple thousand dollars for that in a pickup is not bad. Um, I've also worked on, I've used a, another pickup that was called a, a pendulum pickup. Um, it's about $1,600. 
Um, it is the absolute best sounding built-in pickup I have ever heard in my life. And the very first time I played with one was when John Jennings was still alive. And he had one um, that he had brought here to Hagerstown. Um, and I'd done, uh, I'd done a recording with him. I basically plugged it into the PA system and stuck a mic and turned a mic on in front of his face for him to sing. And I didn't touch anything. And it sounded like the best acoustic guitar recording I'd ever done. Um, so again, you know, I, I, 10 years later, I was at a church and a guy said, yeah, I found one of these pendulum pickups, these uh, systems um, used, and I bought it for $800. And you might think, $800 for a guitar pickup? Are you nuts? And again, he plugged it in and it, and it was just super fantastic. Um, so you can, in fact, get decent sounding pickups. Cheap guitars with cheap pickups are just not very good. Um, so spend the money where it's important. Okay, so now let's talk about feedback, EQ, and fixing feedback. Um, so basically, one of the things that we can do is learn how to get rid of feedback. Um, so basically, a, does everyone know what feedback is? Shall I make some? No, it's, everyone says, no, 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 thanks, no, no, thanks. Um, well, basically, let me, let me show you something that's really, really interesting. Uh, I, will, I will try not to do feedback. Um, but, oh, yeah, Carl can make, he can make, I can make anything. You don't, we, don't, we don't need any feedback right now, Carl. I can do it with the mic, but thank you. Look, he wants to make feedback. Um, let me go ahead and call up something. Give me just a second. Uh, many people don't understand that most of these modern digital mixers have got something. It basically has a, an RTA function built right into it. Let me remember where it is on this guy right here. There it is. Okay. So let's turn on our RTA. Dum, da, dum, dum, dum. Let's get a little bit of sound happening in this first microphone. Oops, I don't even have a way to do it on this one. Um, ooh, let me see. I am going to do something which I swore that I was not going to do. I'm going to run around and patch, repatch something. So <laughs> hang on there, folks. Somebody entertain each other. I'm going to take this guy right here. Please tell me that Caleb did not go in and cook these up too closely. Oh, Caleb. He's trying to make things clean. But guess what? I am not a clean kind of engineering guy. I just ripped all his tape loose back here. I am so sorry. Actually, I'm not in sorry. No, I'm not sorry. I am not sorry at all. Let's see if we can get this linked in. There we go. I got him. So in one. Okay, I've got him. Uh, let's go back to input one. Give me just one second. Do, 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 there we are. So now, there it is. This is what I'm looking for. Bob, bop, 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 bop. So let me get a overhead camera down onto this. And then call that up, if you would, Harold, to the top, to the main screen. Can you call up cam two? Cam two, please. Okay, there we go. So you can see as I am speaking on here, look what, this, look what is running in the background. That is a real-time analyzer running that is showing you exactly where those frequencies are being problematic. So if I were to make this thing whistle, let me see if I can get it right on the edge. Everybody's scared now, aren't you? Hey, hey, hey. You know, I got to gain it up more. Oh, please. Everybody back there is cringing. Okay. Hear it? See right there around 600? Everyone see that going up? Oh, Carol, I need that up on screen. Overhead this, please. Oh, is it? There it is. I'm sorry, I didn't say. I'm looking at the wrong screen. Um, so what I'm trying to do here is get this right. This is what we call ringing out a system. Now, I'm not going to bother to do it right now, but what you can do then is go ahead and 
find that notch. Remember on these, on these digital mixers, we have this ability to go in and select a frequency. We can make something called a, a, a notch filter and just knock that little frequency out. This is called ringing out a system. And so what we do is we start going, we go down the line and just keep notching various frequencies out that are problematic. Feedback occurs because a speaker is pointed at a microphone and there's actually like a loop or a cycle of this thing. So fixing these frequencies will improve this, what we call the GBF or the gain before feedback of the sound system. Um, onboard R RTA functions, most of these consoles, even something as inexpensive as a minus, minus X32 has this built in. It's a 100 band um, real-time analyzer, which all you got to do is hit the little button and turn it on. It's the best teaching tool because when something starts to feedback, what you'll notice there will be a little thing sticking up and you can just basically wind your control right over and just notch that feedback out. The S21 has the same sort of function where you can go in and very easily figure out where the problems are and just, again, just notch these things out. You can also get outboard ones. So this is something from a, a company called Studio 6 Digital. Um, they make a pro they actually integrate something that's called SMART with two A's, S-M-A-A-R-T. I did not misspell that. Um, SMART allows you to not only um, do this at a snapshot, but you can like record this going back in, sp in time so that you can look and see where, where the um, music has more sonic energy during it. It's really kind of cool. Plus it allows you to go help tune rooms, do all kinds of other things. So now let's go in, talk a little bit about frequency carving. Okay. Now here's one of the things. So sep similar sounding instruments in a mix kind of blend in together. Um, I, and what you end up with is kind of this mush. So some of my favorite, favorite mixes out there, what they've done is this frequency carving thing. Um, I guess one of the examples that I really like the most is uh, Linda Ronstadt's You Are No Good. You guys ever listen to that? From what, 70s? It's fantastic. A fantastic uh, singer, great song, really beautiful mix. If you listen to it, what you'll hear is there's a section where the Rhodes piano and the acoustic guitar are happening together, but they are so distinctly different sounding that you can pick them out on the mix. And what they've done is they've gone and added some 500 boost, Hertz boost in the, acoustic, the, the Rhodes piano part to match the 500 Hertz cut. So what they did is they went through the acoustic guitar channel, sliced the big chunk out at 500 Hertz, went over to the um, the channel that stripped coming in with the um, Rhodes piano and did a boost. So it's kind of like taking a, carving a pothole in the road and then fill it in with some other instrument. If you do this correctly, every person will remix the song in their own ears. This is the wonder of this whole process. Um, and I, I think things like this is what helps you, again, with this kick drum bass guitar kind of thing, pianos versus guitars. Um, another thing that I've noted, I've done a, an awful lot of work with Assembly of God churches, and I think every single AG pastor has a guitar or a piano in the trunk of his car. So when I would do one of these things, you know, when they would have a big meeting, I would have five guitar players up on stage doing exactly the same thing, chinga, 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 and I'd go, how in the world am I supposed to mix this? So what I did was I got to work with the choir director, which was really, really fascinating, and I said, okay, I want this first guitar player to play something down here, cruncha, 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 and I want the second one to do some arpeggios, ba 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 and I want the third one to do some chicken scratching, chicka, 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 and I want the fourth one to capo up and do bring, 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 so he's in a completely different signature, and I want you to play on the downbeat, and I don't want you to play on the upbeat, and they're acting like, what, what, this, what is this mysterious thing that you're doing? <laughs> And all of a sudden, you could hear everything in the mix. And they said, we can hear all of the guitar players. I said, yes, this is what a producer does. So many times, um, 
if you're doing your own mixes, whether it's for your own band or whether it's for your church or whatever you're doing, you may not think of this process. You may be self-producing, but if you can get somebody that will step back and leave air and figure out where to leave the space. Now, Carl is my guitar player here that was doing some stuff. When we played years ago, he would tell me, stop playing all those notes. Sometimes I would just be going crazy, and he goes, leave some air. And this is a really, really good idea. So what you're trying to do now is play notes in the right spot, and then the other musician can step in and drop a note in. So really, really great mixes have this pre-produced aspect to it that every musician understands where they need to fit in the mix. This is many times hard for young musicians that think, I'm on stage, I have a big amp, I have to turn it up and play every single note that I can. Doesn't seem to work really well. Um, if you're playing an ensemble where everybody has a different spot, then you should be willing to play that one note. Think about it. Think about how different guitar sounds from like a heavy metal act where the guitars sound like buzz saws, which I like, as opposed to reggae. What does a reggae guitar do? Banging, then it, bat up, bat up, bat up, bat up. Does he complain that he's not out front? No, he doesn't, because guess what? That's what reggae is supposed to sound like. So this is really a matter of figuring out which genre that you're working within and what seems to make sense. Now, we already did a bass guitar and kick drum mix, but I brought a real kick drum and bass guitar here. I'd like to see if we could get Jeff up here. And is Jeremiah floating around? All right, Jeremiah, you want to, now Jeremiah's normally a drummer. I'm going to ask him only to use his right foot today. <laughs> this is a really, really small drum kit over here. That's what, look, he says, I, I can do this, right? Say what now? Um, just go ahead and do what you, your normal, um, what, what makes you comfortable. What we're going to do here, so Jeff has asked me what I would like him to do, and I'm going to say, what would you like to do? Because um, guess what? This is all about trying to figure out what the musicians do. I'm going to go ahead and back this thing off a little bit. And all you're doing is a real simple, let's just move this down so we can see. Okay, so give me half a minute here. So let's get him up on kick. So get Jeremiah, can you give me just a little kick, if you would? Harold, can I have this in the house, please? Okay, ho hold on that. Pull, my, pull, my, pull me down. Pull my voice down. There we go. And Jeff, can I have just a little bit of bass guitar, please? So what I'm going to do here is get them, uh, I, now I'm going to call, I'm going to take their pretty faces off camera so you can kind of see what we're doing over here. So give me just a second. Sure. There we go. So I'm going to go over onto the bass guitar. I'm going to figure out what he's going to do. Um, what's your playing style in this going to be? You're going to be picking? You're going to be fingering? Okay, you're going to be fingering. So not with, not with a lot of slap, okay? So what I'm going to ask Jeremiah to do, I'm going to go over to the kick EQ. And because uh, what I'm going to try to do is put some of this click into there. So go ahead, if you would, Jeremiah, just give me some boom. See, I'm going to provide some of this boost right in here. One second. Whoop, yeah, we're on. There we are. Go ahead. I don't need to provide a lot of bottom end because Jeff is going to provide that. Can you, on your, now hold on, bass guitar. We're going to do the opposite on the bass guitar. In fact, what I'm going to do is get rid of some more of the highs out of it and make this really kind of a bottomy bass. So go ahead and play, if you would, together just a smidge. Bonk, ba bonk, bonk, bonk. See, this is what we're doing over on the bass guitar. 
let's engage that. Whoops, on the kick. This is what we're doing over on the bass guitar. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Checks in the mail uh, after party here or later. Very good. Okay, thank you guys. So everybody see, one of the things that's really good if you can get your musicians to do this during sound check is instead of everybody jumping in and playing at the same time, I want things just like kick drum and bass guitar. I will ask, for instance, the musicians, I'll say specifically, I just want to have... Um, just the, I just want the bass player just to play scales. I want the guy, to, I want the drummer to just play kick and snare so I can listen to those two ratios right in there and figure this out. Really, really good musicians don't have to show off to me. I mean, really, seriously, just play what I ask you to play. When I ask a drummer to, to, to do a sound check, I'm asking him to just kick the kick drum like, like every two seconds, bonk, 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 and keep kicking until I say stop. And I want the bass player to go boom, 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 boom. I want the bass player to just keep playing till we say stop. Again, it's one of these things that musicians somehow think we need to listen to the whole song. We really don't need to listen to the whole song. Um, as a side note, and we talked about this at the last class that we did, but I still highly recommend this idea of a sound check song where instead of the band just jumps in and starts playing, I like to have like the piano player starts and they play through the whole chord progression. They add on an acoustic guitar, they add on to electric guitar, and over a period of about two minutes, they just keep bringing in one instrument at a time. And the very last one to come in is the drummer. And they go chink, 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 boom, and they hit. Well, you see this at a lot of times at big concerts, and you'll also see all the lights sparkling around and everything. Guess what the band is doing? A sound check song, because nobody knows what's plugged into what. They don't know which lighting button is hooked to which light. They're making notes and rapidly thing, doing things, and then uh, they kick into the gear, and then away they go. I think it's a great way for you to learn what each of these things sound like. Another thing that I will note that many um, mix, mixing guys and technicians in churches don't have is headphones. Headphones are your best friend because when you plug them in and hit that solo button or that PFL, you now have the ability to listen to just the kick or just the bass or just whatever it is that you want. And that is the best learning tool possible because as you make EQ changes on it, you hear it in your headphones. So you want to get a decent set of headphones that you can hear these changes. Um, you don't, don't be afraid to spend 100 bucks on a set of headphones. Seriously, um, you know, everybody has their own favorites, ghosts, but, but I do not recommend things like Bose noise canceling phones or anything like that. Uh, the beat stuff is pretty awful. Um, did I just say that on in the world? Um, oh well, I don't care. Um, they're, they're, those types of things make everything sound bottom heavy, but that's not what you need for your mixes. You need um, what we call professional headphones. They don't have any extra boom, they don't have any extra sizzle. They both give you truthful answers as to what the things sound like. So, so that's how I do it. So let's go ahead and talk about room equalization. Um, so the, ag again, everything that we've talked about so far has been all about doing things at um, the microphone level and coming into our mixer and working around on the um, uh, it, it was things within the mix. Can, I, can you get my screen up, please, Harold? There we go. Um, but now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about um, pink noise. Um, so pink noise is this special type of hiss that, that has equal energy per octave. So when you combine it with a calibrated omni mic, and so for instance, I've got one here. Uh, from the guys um, at Studio Six, um, 
you plug this into your iPhone or iPad. I mean, these apps nowadays are the best stuff out there. So you could take, this microphone is 200 bucks, okay? I mean, that sounds like a lot of money, but it really isn't compared to the fact that I used to have to take $10,000 worth of gear around me in a big rack to be able to do what I can do with um, a $20 iPad app and a $200 microphone that plugs into the lightning port. Um, and it allows me to look for all kinds of things within the room. You don't even have to have the special microphone because the mics that are built into your um, iPads and iPhones are really pretty good. Now, for how many of you are Droid users out there? Let's go ahead. Okay, say it. Okay, here's the problem. The only real calibrated apps that exist for the audio world on your phones are iPhone. They're, 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 they just are. Um, if you have a Droid phone and you get one of their apps, you have to calibrate it against something that is known to be accurate, which is typically an iPhone. Oh, say it isn't so. You put the iPhone next to your Droid, you run the sound through it, and then you calibrate, you change the settings in the Droid to match what the iPhone says. Oh, get over it, get over it. Um, if you notice, we've got how many, uh, how many um, Mac computers do we have around here? I mean, they're all one, two, three, four, five. We, we, we bring like six to any gig that we do because Pro Audio really runs off of Mac stuff. And same way with the iPads, all of our stuff is all iPad. I'm, it's, I'm just telling you that we just do it because it's solid and it's always the same and it, and it works. Now, you can, in fact, get specialty tools. So, for instance, here's uh, Audio Tools is a 31-band RTA that you can get for like five bucks, which is really, really fantastic. Now, we're not going to go through the whole rigmarole here today, but what you typically do is play this pink noise through your sound system. And if you'll note on there, there's all these little bands um, that are showing all the different frequencies. Those line up with the same frequencies on a 31-band graphic equalizer and allow you to go ahead and adjust to kind of flatten out the room. So when we talk about the room being flat, we don't mean that it sounds dull, and we do not mean that it sounds out of tune. What we mean is it has equal energy in the mids and the bass and the highs. Now, there are a number of these specialty controllers uh, some of them, for instance, um, uh, the stuff from Drive Rack, DBX Drive Rack, that have built-in automatic functions. That you just stick the microphone in the room and you turn it on and it does pink noise. I gotta tell you, I've been at dozens of sites where they've done this special room calibration thing and it sounds miserable, it just does. I start with nothing more than a song that I know really, really well listening on really good studio speakers and then by ear, I just tune the system. And when I get done with it, it looks really good compared uh, on the RTA, and it sounds really, really good. Part of this is this process of learning, ba basically calibrating your own ears. I honestly believe that your best instrument is your ears, and people play, they just don't take care of them anymore. They, they really, really don't. I think it's sad that young kids play stuff way too loud, um, I, and I did when I was younger, and my kids now, they, they use hearing protection when they mow the lawn. They do. All of my sound systems in my house sound the same. They're, I don't mess with bass controls. I've got high-end sound systems in the living room, in my studio, in my truck. Every single thing is calibrated the same way. So when I play a song anywhere, it sounds the same. That means when I go to a big sound system in a conference center, in a church, no matter where it is, I know what that particular song is supposed to sound like. I already have it in my head what it's supposed to sound like. I remember years ago, I had a guy at one of the churches who said, all these mixes sound awful. All the mixes in the world sound awful. And he wants everything to sound his special way. And I asked him what he had, and he had like double 18s and all this other stuff. And I said, well, that should be pretty slamming. He says, but their stuff doesn't sound like my stuff when he mixes it. I couldn't quite, and he, and he says he's called the guys at, I, I forget, there was some high-end speaker company, Turbo Sounds or whatever, and he called the amp guys, and he called everybody else, and everybody said, he says, they all tell me that I'm crazy. 
And I said, well, let me figure out what's going on. I said, what do you listen to at home for stereo? He goes, I don't have a home system. I've got a great car system. And I said, okay, what do you listen to in your car? And he says, I got a pair of 15 inch kickers in the back. So 15 inch subwoofers in the trunk of his car. Okay, so guess what he thinks music is supposed to sound like? Boom, 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 boom. He thinks everything's supposed to sound like that. And I said, well, look, I said, you are wrong and everybody else is right. Well, why is that? And I said, well, because you're not following the intent of the artist, of the producer, of whoever. He says, well, I don't like how they mix. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but that's what it's supposed to sound like. If you try to take this stuff and make it sound different, then you are not doing the music any favor. So what I'm telling you guys is you should go get yourself, treat yourself to a decent hi-fi system at home with a nice woofer, a 2.1 sound system at least. Don't mess with the tone controls. I calibrate my living room with a laser because I can. Um, but when I get done with things and you go listen to it, it's spectacular. It, it really does sound really great. And that's what I tend to listen to things with so that I, my own ears can calibrate to know this is what Steely Dan sounds like. This is what Led Zeppelin sounds like. This is what Pink Floyd sounds like. Name your favorite, you know, Mott the Hoople, I don't care, Beyonce, whatever. There's all kinds of great productions, but you need to go listen to the, the thing on a high-end system. And when I say high-end, you could get a decent system for a few thousand dollars. It doesn't have to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. But if you're going to be doing this for real, you need to protect your ears from stupid things like lawnmowers running and, um, and chainsaws. And you need to listen to music that's properly calibrated on, on a properly calibrated system. And that's the only way that you'll learn how to do this. Okay, we're coming up on the end of this. So that's a wrap of this part of it. Visit LiveSoundAdvice.com for more articles and videos. We're going to be starting a weekly webcast of this, a uh, shorter one very soon. Um, um, and email us, info at LiveSoundCo.com. And again, I would like to thank our sponsors, Digico, Tectonic, Black Magic Design, Electro Voice and Semantic Audio for providing gear for all of this. If you have questions, feel free to uh, ask, you know, shoot me an email, mike at livesoundco.com or jeremiah at livesoundco.com or info at livesoundco.com for anything, any needs that you need, AV systems, media installations, design work, whatever you like. All right, very, very good. And we're out. Thank you all.